Hi everyone, um, I'm Hannah Skeen, I work at Chelsea Westminster Hospital and I'm going to talk through with you uh, assessment units running an efficient effective AMU, a little bit of an early senior assessment and some, uh, some slides on consultants and staffing. So what does an efficient and effective AMU look like? Um, now of course you will be uh, working in units that are called acute medical units, acute assessment units, but what I mean by an acute medical unit is, is really the admissions area for, for medical adult patients. And really what I look to still is the task force document from 2007, Acute Medical Care. And although it seems quite an old document now, the, the mantra of it in terms of the right person, right place, right time is still very true today. Um, and it's a very good reference guide for any of you that are, are looking to develop your units. And of course it's all about doing today's work today. And it's about staffing and being equipped uh, to deal exclusively with acute medical patients transferred either from the emergency department or the community um, and about doing that special medical and multidisciplinary assessment. So what are the objectives of an effective AMU? Now these slides are going to be, feel quite wordy but it's so that you can look back at them at a later date so um, apologies if they, they fill a lot of information. But the, the objectives of an effective AMU, well, yes, it's that rapid and comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment led by acute care physicians. Um, it's about that early consultant review and, if necessary, referral to an appropriate specialty team. You want rapid turnarounds and diagnostics. You want that comprehensive geriatric assessment service there with uh, links into the community as needed. Um, and, of course, we're aiming to uh, reduce the waiting times for patients in ED to access hospital beds and therefore eliminating the need for boarding patients as well. Um, and trying to stop patients moving after hours. And by that, really, I think we should stop moving patients between wards after 8 o'clock at night. Um, we look to, of course, standardise the way that we manage care of the acutely ill, and the AMU uh, is the perfect place to put those protocols and guidelines in place. We're trying to optimise alternatives to admission, and that's where um, Jack Hawkins will talk to you about ambulatory care in a while. And uh, we're, although it seems a nice to to facilitate research into the care of the acutely ill on the acute medical unit, you'll all actually be generating a huge amount of useful data uh, which can be used to, to research. And of course, we're trying to reduce staff fatigue and improve staff morale by, by improving the rotors and the way that they work. So what can effective AMUs actually achieve? There's quite a lot of data out there now, and it's worthwhile just having a look over it again. Um, this is Bernard Silk's data from Dublin, um, where he did a prospective study of over uh, 33,000 patients, and they saw uh, a 45, uh, sorry, 44% relative reduction in 30-day inpatient mortality over the first five years of their AMU being opened, um, and that uh, essentially led to a numbers needed to treat of 18 people. Um, and they've looked at it since then, and that uh, MNT has dropped even further to 11.9%. They also saw other benefits, so the number of patients in ED waiting more than four hours for a bed reduced by nearly a third, and at 7am in the morning when they looked at their ED and how many people were waiting for a bed, that had fallen from an average of 14 to 2 in the five years. And of course that's important because we know that people waiting in ED, uh, their subsequent 30-day inpatient mortality increases uh, from just 5% if you're waiting less than two and a half hours for a bed to more than 17% if you're waiting greater than nine hours. So Bernard Silk felt that his AMU has actually probably resulted in saving uh, over 4,000 bed days per year. Royal Liverpool Hospital, they also uh, did a study after their, before and after their AMU opened in 1999, and they saw a drop in all-cause hospital mortality for general medical patients from 7.2 to 5.9%, and the reduction was particularly marked in the under 65 year group. They also saw uh, that patient flow from the acute medical unit to the appropriate specialty improved dramatically as well. Uh, Chelsea and Westminster, where I am here, we looked also at direct home discharge rates after opening our AMU, and they've increased both at the 24 hour and the 48 hour mark. And our length of stay, even just after four months of opening the acute medical unit, fell from 9.3 to 7.8 days. And I've put a few more examples here, but essentially what they're showing you is that overall length of stay of general medical patients drops if you've got an effective acute medical unit, and the number of patients going directly home from your acute medical unit will also increase. Um, and interesting, Bournemouth also saw that their outlier bed days dropped by 16% as well. So what are the success factors? Well, I think the top two here are absolutely crucial, and that's about having a governance structure that includes medical, nursing, and allied health professional staff, 
And that means uh, good leadership, and essentially leadership from consultant clinicians. But of course, with the support of hospital management there to help. You need a really strong SOP, so rigorous business rules about who comes to your unit and what the discharge process is for patients. And that should be something that's designed and bought in by all parties so that people stick to it. You need generalist physicians taking part in the acute rota. Again, that helps with the buy-in from other physicians. And also the reality is that we don't have enough acute physicians in the UK yet to be completely self-sufficient. You need dedicated multidisciplinary support, and that's not just nursing and, and junior doctors and, and pharmacists, but don't forget clerical staff and porters. Um, and we talked about co-location to the emergency department, but I appreciate that that's not uh, a reality for many trusts who are working in older buildings, but certainly a good working relationship with your ED colleagues is crucial. Try daily ward rounds is a must, prioritise access to diagnostics as well. Um, and I've spoken already about having uh, standardised evidence-based protocols in place so that you're reducing variation in a way that you manage common presentations. Um, if you've got patients who do need specialty input, then that should be early on. Um, and you need also to have access to uh, clinic appointments uh, post-discharge and any other services that you think would help uh, get your patients back out into the community safely. All this as well, another success factor is really looking at your service regularly, getting feedback on quality indicators, and that requires strong IT support, and, and IT is, is well worth investing in. Of course, there are barriers um, to those good, uh, those good practices, and the common ones we come across are that recruitment can be really difficult, particularly for nurses and allied health professionals who've got acute assessment skills. So we often see units manage to employ band five newly qualifieds, they get them trained up and then they tend to move on. Um, and and that's, that's difficult. And, and of course that affects uh, your nurse-patient ratio, particularly for using a lot of agency staff as well. And what we don't really want to see is that one to five ratio slipping. Exit block is very much talked about by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, but of course it's a phenomenon that affects the acute medical unit as well. And that can either be blocked trying to get people home again due to transport or community services, or blocked by moving patients into inpatient beds and general medical units. And it's the realisation by the whole organisation that really exit block is not just one department's problem, it's a system issue that needs to look at. Some units do struggle in terms of their AMU being used as beds for other, uh, other types of patients, so particularly inter-hospital transfers or repatriation uh, patients, that's inappropriate. Um, and I know it's difficult sometimes, there's a lot of politics in hospitals and different characters, but cooperation from specialty colleagues, particularly with low acuity, high complexity cases, is absolutely crucial. The thing that the medical staff worry about, of course, is burnout. It's a high-paced, high-acuity environment. Continuity isn't always there, and it can be very stressful. But I'll go through some tips in terms of consultant job planning that can help with that. So I've mentioned already that quality indicators are a good way of looking at where you are this now and areas to target in terms of improvement. And there are a lot of them out there, and, and these three here are the ones I tend to refer to the most often. That's the NHS London Acute Care Standards, the Society for Acute Medicine and Clinical Quality Indicators and the West Midlands uh, Urgent Care Standards. And of course there's overlap between the three of them, but essentially they're all singing from the same hymn the, the same home sheet. I've picked out just a few here, but of course um, there is a much more comprehensive list within the documents themselves. Um, so the ones I've picked out here are about having early warning scores as soon as you arrive to an acute medical unit, and then at regular intervals with the appropriate response systems in place. Um, all patients should be seen by a competent decision maker, clinical decision maker, within four hours of arrival. I think four hours is actually quite a long time to be sitting as a patient, so 30 minutes really. Um, and that's about getting that assessment, that full clerking done and a plan started. Um, in terms of what counts as a competent clinical decision maker, there's lots of discussion around this. For me, in terms of getting a full clerking and plan started, it's really F2 and above. But of course it's going to be with the support of registrars and consultants there. Um, all admissions should be seen and assessed by a relevant consultant within 12 hours of decision to admit or 14 hours of arrival at hospital. Again, that's a minimum. That's quite a long time to be sitting as a patient. We should be aiming to, to get consultants to see them sooner than that. All patients may and should be seen twice daily by a consultant. You want 24-7 access to key diagnostics to help with those decision making. Um, and you, again, you can make uh, decisions with your diagnostics department about what counts as critical, urgent and non-urgent and the timeframes around that. 
And the last thing I put here in terms of quality indicators, the multidisciplinary assessment that should be undertaken within 14 hours and certainly plan in place within 24 hours. Um, actually, there are patients when I can't get near the patient because the multidisciplinary team have, have got to the patient before me, and, and that's excellent because they're getting the discharge plan started early on. So we talk about what, what do you need in your AMU in terms of physical space, but of course it's worth having the caveat here, which is in that yellow box, that capacity is not just about physical space, but it's about having the functionality as well. Um, we've said already, co-location VD and diagnostics is, is lovely, but it's not always possible, but certainly good working relationships are crucial. You're going to need a, an assessment area where patients are in a trolley or a chair type area, they're not in a bed. Um, ambulatory care area, again, ideal if it's part of your unit or co-located. You need enough beds to cope with your take. Um, you need short stay beds, and more frequently as well, we're beginning to see frailty beds or frailty units embedded within an acute medical unit. Um, lots of you will have monitored areas, but some units go up as far as level two care within the assessment unit as well. You'll all be used to try to provide single sex accommodation, um, and one of the other things that we find is that side rooms are, are um, oversubscribed, um, and certainly patients that are in side rooms often wait longer to move to another appropriate ward because uh, we don't have enough side rooms in the UK. Um, that bottom line about dispensary, therapies, assessment areas, um, seminar rooms for teaching and handover, office space, and a, and a procedure room to, to do all your, to have all your kit in one place. They might seem like niceties and extras, but actually they're really crucial uh, to keeping flow moving through your unit. So I'm going to move on now to early senior assessment. Um, and as we said already, the minimum is really patients being seen by a clinician, uh, a consultant clinician within 14 hours. But you know, if someone's sick, it should really be within an hour, and I would aim for kind of three hours uh, for the others. And of course, that means extended working hours, um, and it's not uncommon for acute physicians to be present till at least kind of 10 o'clock at night. With early senior assessment, the word that people often think of is triage, um, and the one thing I'd say about triage is it does work, and it can work, but it only works if you're doing something of value for the patient. So don't just create a queue for the sake of having a queue and then waiting to be clerked. So there are lots of systems out there. They're called all different types of things, see and treats, rapid assessment, mind the gap is what we have at Chelsea. Um, but the, 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 the point being that that assessment is actually doing something for the patient. It's signposting them or it's getting investigations done or treatment started. And um, because that's a rapid assessment, literally kind of three or four lines in the notes, a few minutes, um, some places do count that as your consultant review. Personally, I don't. I don't think you have all the information in front of you to count it as that. Um, and I think particularly if you're assessing an ED uh, with that type of model, I don't think that counts either. But places do work differently with that. I've said about extended working hours to make that work. And the senior assessment as well should be starting the discharge planning process as well in terms of what's going to be needed for discharge and timing and follow-up arrangements. Um, this is just our example at Chelsea. Mind the gap, just because we're surrounded by the tube system. Um, but here you can see it's the front page of our clerking document, and it has a few common investigations that we just want to get done. And the top kind of eight presentations that we see are there. So again, the registrar and the consultant see the patient for just literally a few minutes as they come into the unit can get things started, so it's not time lost for that patient. You'll have seen um, the Safer Wardrobe Bundle tool, and uh, that can be used in the acute medical unit as well. And of course, it's about getting that senior review done before midday. It's about having discharge dates in place. It's about moving patients through to inpatient wards before midday and getting people out of the hospital earlier on. And of course, that's not just about today's work today. That's actually about thinking about tomorrow's work today as well in terms of planning the pharmacy and transport. And not so relevant in terms of acute medical units, the last one review, but um, hopefully people aren't on acute medical units for longer than 14 days. But it's about having a systematic review of patients, particularly multidisciplinary review, if there are uh, anticipated difficulties in terms of getting patients discharged. But there are lots of other wardrobe checklists out there, and again, it can be useful for standardizing processes on acute medical unit, making them more efficient without compromising on safety, and it reduces the variability within the unit as different staff come into work. So I'm going to talk a bit about staffing now. Um, so consultants, when on the acute medical unit, really should be completely free from any other clinical duties or elective commitments. Um, they need to be present on the unit and with their, with their minds solely on that job. 
Building in continuity is really important because it does help reduce stress and it does make the system more sustainable. So moving away from the physician of the day model. So um, if I meet a patient today, I want to see that patient again tomorrow if they're still in the acute medical unit. Building in prospective cover is really important. Again, as an acute physician, I can't just go and leave and cancel the unit for the week. So building prospective cover uh, into the rotas is really important. And giving a range of intensities of work into our rota, again, just helps make it feel sustainable. Extended day working we've spoken about, really, you will be able to match your activity in the day, but we all know kind of the 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at night tends to be a busiest time, so you need to match your staffing to that. Tri-daily ward rounds need to be included in that. And as I said at the start, one of the major success factors for AMUs is having that governance and leadership there. And that needs to be recognised in the job plan because it does take a significant amount of time up. Um, you need buy-in from specialists and generalists. I think one of my tips for that is really keep them involved in the acute medical unit. So working in tandem with them. Um, and again, it helps embed processes and routine. It helps them understand the challenges eliminates uh, variability and you get much better buy and they, they understand when they're not on the assessment unit that they need to be uh, working hard on their base units to, to help the AMU flow continue. Um, and the way you refer to specialty consultants, again, lots of different models out there. It can be as part of the board rounds, it can be a one-to-one -one request, or it may be that you decide your acute medical unit uh, consultant has the final say in who goes where. Um, if you have somebody on your assessment unit who is under a different specialty, you need to decide who is responsible for that patient and make that very clear to everybody. And there are pros and cons to having patients under different specialties within the assessment unit. Personally, I'm not a big fan. I like to have control over my beds um, and know everybody that's under my care of it, but everyone works differently. Junior doctors, lots of time is much better than just turning up for an on-call once a week. Um, making them geographically based is useful as well. So, you know, these are your two basic patients to look after today. And I've mentioned already about matching shift to demand. And it's been really good work done at Nottingham a few years ago. Um, and I've put the reference at the end of this for you to look at. But again, just looking at arrival times of patients and making sure that patient wait times are not uh, too long because of a lack of staff available to see them. Nursing-wise, there's some great documents sitting on the Society for Acute Medicine website around workforce planning and nursing ratios and competencies, which I've uh, signposted to. Um, but it's important that you have a dedicated nurse coordinator each day who's uh, on the ward rounds with you, who's aware of the decision being made, who can prioritise who moves where and get that flow moving. Um, I said that retention and recruitment of nursing staff can be difficult, and one of the things we've done locally is put a practice development nurse in just for the acute medical unit. Um, and that's improved things enormously, actually, uh, and we've, we've got much less staff turnover. Of course, the system needs multidisciplinary staff, so pharmacy to be on your rounds, doing the meds reconciliation, having TTAs ready, ready to go, um, all makes things move a bit faster. Um, allied health professionals, you need dedicated ones for your assessment units. Um, they should be screening everybody at the point of assessment. So again, really thinking about discharge planning early on and making sure that your OTs and physios can do joint assessment skills and, and have got the equipment ready uh, to be able to use. Having a social worker um, dedicated to the assessment unit as well is incredibly useful, particularly if you're dealing with lots of different community partners. Dedicated portering can help get people to diagnostics and move people around wards. And uh, a lot of the delays I see in various hospitals are around uh, patients who require psychiatric assessment. And again, having 24-7 access to at least psych liaison um, is uh, very beneficial. Um, you'll know yourself that when you're on the unit, you'll be answering phones and opening doors and trying to find notes. Um, and really having enough clerical and administrative staff in a unit is really crucial. Again, it frees up clinical staff to be doing clinical duties. Um, and I've put cleaning staff in there as well, because actually, again, having your own cleaning staff can help turn around bed spaces fast, particularly when it's getting busy in the evening. So I've just got two more slides, really, of useful tips that just came to mind when putting this together. Um, around planning capacity and staffing, please try and plan it so that you're meeting variations in your admission numbers. So if I say that my average admission number is 50, I will be wrong 50% of the time. So try and plan for the, the top end of what you're expecting. Um, you need the numbers of beds and trolleys uh, to cope, just with, not just with your take, but you're kind of anticipating that you might be turning over up to twice every 24 hours. And really, um, you will shoot yourself in the foot tomorrow if you put beds in that trolley assessment area at night time. You've really got to shut that down. 
uh, and uh, you know, not scupper your flow for the next day. Um, the frail elderly, I've, I've mentioned about having frailty facilities that um, either in the AMU or another dedicated area, but they should be managed by clinicians competent in comprehensive geriatric assessment. Um, and I've spoken about board, uh, daily board rounds as well in terms of having a multidisciplinary team there. So again, keeping the tempo going uh, and prioritizing the tasks for the day. So you're doing today's work now, not tomorrow. Uh, we sit down with the whole team each week because I think just trying to highlight um, problems, either recurrent problems or one-offs that have occurred that week are really useful to kind of uh, air and explore and, and get quick solutions in place. So um, it's a useful exercise to have. Um, and the last one I've put there is around discharge lounge, being open extended hours with registered staff um, and having trolley spaces available so the patients are going home in ambulances and have got somewhere to go. Um, IT investment uh, is not something we see very often, but it's really helpful. So you need visible patient flow. You need to know what's in your beds, how far those patients are through their patient journey, and what's anticipated to happen next, and that everyone can see it and work together to, to get that flow moving. Electronic tape lists as well, so not just a bit of paper uh, kind of sell the tape to the desk. Um, and of course, all that will help generate data for you, which you can look at in real time and put some context to it. And, and that's a much easier way of identifying when things start to go wrong in, in areas that you need to be more focused about. Um, some of us are moving towards electronic records. We're not all there yet, but certainly if you've got a paper document that you're using as a parking booklet, try and make sure that all staff are using the same document. Again, it helps us to speed up processes and, and doesn't have lots of different uh, paper all over the place. Um, we had a problem with labs batching samples, again, trying to get them to prioritise as per ED. Um, there is a place for bedside testing and ring fencing scan slots, but again, you want to tailor that locally to your demands and, and what services you've got. Um, most of us are moving away from midnight occupancy uh, and looking towards uh, what occupancy looks like through the day, um, because as we know, kind of 4 p.m., 8 p.m. is when we are really uh, the most pushed and should be looking at what our state looks like at that time. And the last thing I've put here, um, is a right handover. So even if you have the most efficient and effective AMU in the UK, you need to make sure that those patients that are moving on from your care to other specialty teams have a robust handover. So that's the, the momentum uh, and the tempo we keep going. So I'm going to stop there. I've got um, some references there which you'll be able to access on uh, the website later. Really just some of the data I've shown you there and the guidelines and the quality indicators and I'll hand over to Jack. Hannah, thank you very much. Uh, just a tiny bit of technical stuff going on here. Uh, is that showing my screen? Yes. It is. As a full screen? No. Thank you. There. Good. Um, Hannah, thank you very much. I think uh, I'd just like to pick up on one of the key themes that ran all the way through your excellent presentation, and that was this idea of standardising how we work and uh, rigorously removing variation from what we do. And I've got a few, just a few thoughts around that. Um, this is how we work here. This is our vision. This is how we agree to do it. And just thinking about other businesses, I mean, I just wonder how much variation people like Sainsbury's, British Airways, McLaren F1 bring into their work. And I suggest they spend a lot of time doing it very differently, um, a lot of time working hard to make sure they don't do it differently. And I think that's a, a key thing around this ESIP program. How do we remove variation so that patient care is the same day in, day out? Both acute medicine units and ambulatory care lend themselves beautifully for that, not least because they're kind of new, so being led by you and I who can stick our own stamp on this. So ambulatory emergency care is a way of converting the medical take from bedded to non-bedded. Uh, just thinking about some visions that we might have. So um, all patients are ambulatory unless the only way we can deliver their care is from a bed. At the bottom I've put one here from the Institute of Health Improvement. Don't kill me, don't hurt me, don't waste my time and don't waste my money. Just some high level thoughts there. What are we trying to achieve? Are we all signed up to it and are we delivering it? 
There is a directory of ambulatory emergency care for adults, uh, which includes 49 different uh, HRG codes, which is convenient because you can go and look and see by HRG codes how many of these patients are getting into your beds or not. We've written an acute care toolkit, which is freely available from the Royal College of Physicians. It's four sides or six sides. It's short and it's a recipe for how to do it well. Uh, this presentation uh, follows it closely. Now we've had some comments around the name because ambulatory suggests walking and patients have no idea what we mean by it. Nonetheless, it's stuck as a, as a, a title for what we do. Um, it's same day emergency care. The patients are on this slide here, they're in, in the red circle. There are a large number of patients who stay a few days in hospital. And the hypothesis, the proven hypothesis, is that in this group of people are a number of people who can go home the same day. And that's what we're trying to achieve. In working well with the patients in the red circle, we find that the patients in the green circle get better, quicker care as well. So there are four models of AEC, broadly speaking. Uh, the first three, passive, pathway and pull, uh, are all important in, in part, particularly pathway. Uh, there are great pathways of care and I would encourage you to find the high volume uh, patient uh, complaints and set them up on a pathway that is rigorously monitored. Our preferred method is process and that is all patients are considered for ambulatory emergency care. It's important to understand your own systems. I'm sure you do, but there is nothing like writing down what happens on a process map like this. This shows a, a, a hospital and their admissions process. At the top, that's patients who are definitely ambulatory. In the middle is a gray area, patients who might be ambulatory, the trickiest group, in all honesty. And then at the bottom, the patients who absolutely can't be ambulatory because they have sepsis and need monitoring, for example. The gray area is where I would encourage you to look and work. What is it that's stopping patients going home the same day? If it's waiting for something, what is it? And how can you remove the wait? So a new rule for the medical take. It's old now, but we call it a new rule. The only acceptable reason for admission to hospital is that you are sick or the potential to be sick very quickly. Everything else, there is ambulatory emergency care. So around patient selection, some nice simple questions, simple rules in complex systems. You'll hear that from the ESET team repeatedly. Is the patient clinically stable? Is the patient functionally capable of being managed in the AEC unit? Now, that's a slightly tricky one. I think there are patients who we would consider older and frailer who may not be ambulatory but who would really benefit from same-day emergency medical care. And to my mind, those are the people who come in perhaps quite unwell, nearing the end of their lives with a, an acute problem that does not need hospitalization but can be cared for in the residential or nursing home that they came from. But what they definitely do need is someone to make a diagnosis and treatment quickly. So is the patient functionally capable of being managed in the AEC unit? It's a bit about how we work how we set up the unit, what we're prepared to say yes to. Would this patient have been admitted to hospital before AEC existed? There is an opportunity for if you build it, they will come to be reality. So there is an opportunity for the ambulatory emergency care to become an outpatient clinic for patients who had previously been seen in another specialism. That is not the purpose of it and that will chew into the capacity for us to turn the medical take into same day care. And finally, could the patient's needs be better met by another service? The AM score is a brilliant tool, but it was uh, uh, invented in 2010, so it's five years old now. Uh, Les Aller and team wrote it. You give a score, 
for each of these uh, these criteria. And a score of five or more means that you're highly likely to be ambulatory. If I can just draw your eye to the fourth one down, IV treatment not anticipated by referring doctor. I think lots of places now have uh, outpatient IV antibiotic therapy uh, uh, teams. And therefore, just, just to give you a flavor, whilst I think this is good, I think it needs modifying to your own service. My worry is that there are patients who would be ambulatory now who don't get a high AM score and therefore get admitted to beds. So how to get started? Well, look, most of you are started, have an ambulatory emergency care. I think it's just useful to refresh this though. Enthusiastic, capable clinicians, nurse practitioners, the whole team, including the management, behind wanting this to be successful. Where the ambulatory emergency care unit is, is clearly key. I know that real estate is difficult, but I would argue to have yours near your accident and emergency or emergency department and the AMU, AAU, MAU, uh, to, so that patients can uh, be managed without having to walk all around the hospital. No barriers to good care. You need waiting facilities, consulting rooms and trolleys, or recliner chairs. Diagnostic support needs to mirror the emergency department, so all blood tests and radiology should be on the same uh, service level agreement as for the ED. So blood tests back within an hour, radiology, CT scans within an hour, reported within 30 minutes after that. Whatever they are in your hospital, make sure that your ambulatory emergency care is aligned with those. So it's key to make the processes efficient. All the processes that you, uh, the patients need in order to get home. We've talked about bloods, we've talked about radiology. Um, hot clinics are relatively new. Uh, we haven't got a definition yet, but we're looking to make one, um, which essentially is an opportunity for a patient to get urgent care in another specialty where otherwise they would have been admitted. Pharmacists are key. TTOs are a reason for people not going home frequently. So is there some way that pharmacy can work differently with your ambulatory emergency care? For example, using outpatient scripts, uh, have the drug cupboards stocked with the most common drugs, nurses able to do uh, uh, dispensing. The nurses need to think and predict what will be required. This is Primarily consultant delivered, not just led. Use the telephone. We still invite people to come back to hospital when really they don't need to. Um, everybody that we have to bring back to the hospital is another person we'd have to look after in the hospital. So a bit about measurement and evaluation. Uh, you will need to know how you're doing. So the first thing is, and back to that idea of a vision, are you clear on your aim? What is it that you're trying to do? We must know what we are doing. Are you measuring the right things? Are you tracking the right patient groups? Can you identify them? Can you map and the flows of patients around your system? And this idea of demonstrate a return on investment, we're living in a financially challenged time. We have to be able to justify what we're up to. So measure your activity, how many patients, what's wrong with them, how did they get to you, uh, how many are new, how many are coming back for follow-up. And then measure the impact of what you've done, what's happening to the four-hour standard, non-elective medical bed days, ambulance handovers, overall length of stay, what it's like to be a patient or a staff member in this department. And also, whilst doing that, what's your potential to grow if I could get same day MRI scans in my hospital, I would be able, I think, to send an extra two patients home per day. So what's the business case around that? How do I make sure that we're either happy with where we are or we're moving to improve the same day care? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I do rather enjoy a process map. Um, so this is how patients get in to the hospital and the flows. 
there are numbers alongside these as well and it's incumbent on us to, to know really what's going on who are these people where are they coming from that way when we make changes to the opening times for example of our AEC we can see what the effect is across the system this is a simple two by two uh, uh, and the way that I recommend we use this is to go and look at notes of patients on the ward as a snapshot on the AMU and see is there an opportunity was this patient could this patient have been managed in the AEC and if so they're in that missed opportunity group and what is it that we need to do so that they can be seen in the AEC I've talked a lot about the the, the processes of the team um, it is of course all about patients and we have to take much more notice of the services we're setting up also staff I think it was Richard Branson who said recently that the staff were the most important part of his business because if they get it right then it's great for the customer as well so are we aware of the other what might be called softer measures that I don't really think are softer measures they're probably the real measures so what's it like to be a patient and what's it like to work in an AEC and here's some a, ver a selection of ways We seem to have lost uh, Jack there. Um, Emma, I don't know if you could uh, step in and. Uh... Oh, oh, he's back. Sorry, Jack. We seem to have lost you for a, a minute or so there. Ah, okay. Where did you Where did you get to? That 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 slide. Yeah. Slide. Was I yeah. talking at all, or had it just come up? Um, I lost you. I don't know if Emma lost you. Then I'll just start with this slide. So, experience-based design. We need to make sure that we're considering what it's like for patients and staff in the areas they work it's so key so the opportunity exists to write leaflets have uh, information in our AECs that explain to patients what they're getting there are still a number of complaints every day to say I wasn't expecting this I came from bed or you kept me waiting for a long time so how can we minimize the chance of that feeling wrong for the patient uh, we can use uh, patient experience questionnaires and uh, staff stories and there is a so what at the end of this they're, they're not just nice soft touch things they're real and we need to respond to what we learn from them so here is an example this is a, a, a patient questionnaire so an easy stuff to solve so the patient area could be brightened up a bit some pictures some water some music, some magazines, um, and then some feedback to the nursing team. Uh, the patient didn't feel very welcome at the time, but what a great bit of data to learn from. Now, sustainability. Um, you will all be being asked as part of this ESIP program to undertake a sustainability uh, assessment. If you haven't yourself, can you find out how um, to, to do one? We need as many of them as possible in each site. Uh, the bigger the team who do it, the better. What, we, what it does, it asks a variety of questions and asks you to grade between one and 10 your answer to that question. We then collate it and we look at the gap between the, the, the highest possible and the lowest possible per answer that will make sense in a moment so here is the sustainability assessment and you can see that staff involvement in training staff behaviors towards sustaining the change and senior leadership engagement give the biggest gap between the red line what's possible and the blue line what's felt and therefore those things need working on locally in order to make sure that the uh, project, the AEC, the improvement plan 
is likely to be is, has the most chance of being sustained. So an, an appeal, can you please get involved in the sustainability assessment in your health community? I'm not sure that you need convincing uh, about the, uh, the successes that you can have with ambulatory emergency care. However, here's a few uh, comments and quotes. So the Whittington Hospital, who are absolutely flying with redesigning the, the, the way that they deliver emergency care around their ambulat ambulatory emergency care unit, uh, got a large investment in order to improve it because they showed that it worked. Uh, a large proportion of the patients in many hospitals now have same-day care. Bath have increased, have widened what they do around ambulatory emergency medical care and incorporate into the surgical pathway and have amazing results. So this is the effect on the four-hour standard, uh, the introduction of AEC. So you can see a step change uh, in the graph. This is the reduction in medical length of stay by introducing AEC and a reduction in hospital bed days. Or every single patient that gets sent home is one fewer in, to be cared for in a bed and one more who's had high quality care. This is Kettering doing a marked improvement in the uh, four hour standard. Likewise, a reduction in the medical outliers per month. And this is Heft, Heart of England, showing the impact on ambulance handovers. So the common challenges that we experience, um, lack of executive support, it, it, it almost feels like it shouldn't be up there anymore. It's so easy, it feels nowadays, to convince the executive team that this is useful. Two or three years ago, less so. Poor project infrastructure. So if you want to maximize your ambulatory emergency care, are you still meeting? Are you still checking against the vision? Are you still looking at your metrics and the data that's coming out? Do you have the right team? Are you open the right hours? Have a look at when your patients actually need you to be open and try and match that. Skepticism, again, it feels like that's waning. This is becoming work as normal. Poor patient streaming, well, that a two by two tool that I showed you earlier will help with um, identifying if you've got poor patient streaming and give you the opportunity to do something about it. Inappropriate space, you need to be able to work in the space you've got to deliver the patient care. Work out what the constraints are and put, uh, organize a business case. And then finally, overnight bedding of the unit. Do not bed patients in your ambulatory care unit. It saves a few breaches or it helps in the moment, but it can take days and days to unpick. And then all those patients who would have been going home the same day get into bed. So it really magnifies the problem. So what do you need? Um, back to that enthusiastic word, great word. So you need an enthusiastic team wanting this to work. You need management and administrative support. You need leadership. Setting a vision. What is it we're trying to do? You need your executive to want it to work alongside you. Commissioners need to know what you're up to and they need to support what you're doing. And you need clear aims and plans and an operational plan understood by all. So just finally, back to that point I started with about what is acceptable around variation and how we work. This is a great opportunity to really forge a strong team that decides how it works, what it's trying to deliver, and that it's going to continuously improve this process. Thank you. Okay. Hannah is still on the line. I am, yep. We'd be very happy to take any questions, either spoken or um, sent through to us by uh, is it email they send them through, Lisa? No, Jack, there's a, there's a questions tab on um, there. They should have like a little drop down menu and they can either type a question in there if they don't have access to audio and I can ask it um, for them or um, everyone can be unmuted and they can ask their questions directly.
So if I, I will unmute everyone. And um, if anybody has any questions for Jack or for Hannah. So I muted a couple of people getting quite a bit of background noise there. Does anybody have any questions for Jack or Hannah? I think I have a question. Okay. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, no. I'll we'll hand over to, to Emma. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, it doesn't appear that there are any questions coming through. Um, firstly, apologies there for technical issues. I think the weather's having an impact on, uh, on the technology today. Um, can I just say thank you very much to um, Hannah Skeen, who's um, an acute physician from Leicester, who was able to join us today, and to Jack Hawkins as well, um, an acute medicine geriatrician practicing in Leicester. Um, thank you very much both for those presentations. Um, just to remind people that those presentations have been recorded and they will be up on the website along with the slide sets as soon as possible for you to refer to. Um, oh, sorry. If there are any sorry, I'm a Andrew Phillips would like to ask a question. Um, Andrew, I can unmute you. Hi Andrew, can you hear? I may not have audio. His question is, our local trust is getting on with seven of the 90 AMB care pathways. It sounds like this is not the way forwards and we should be looking at all attend attendances and filter those that are not AEC. I don't, I don't know whether, I think that's probably a question for you, Jack. Hi, Jack. You seem to have, yes. to have lost Jack again there. Hi, Jack. Can you hear? It may be something to do with the, the terrible weather we're having. Uh, we, we do seem to have lost Jack there, Andrew, I'm afraid, but um, I'll send on your question to him, and I'm sure he'll respond to you uh, shortly. Similarly, if there are any other questions from anybody that's dialed in at the moment, um, if you're unable to pose them now, um, you are more than welcome to send them through to the e in email inbox. The address for that is ecipinfo, so e-c-i-p-i-n-f-o at nhselect.org.uk, and we will pass them on to Hannah and Jack as appropriate to come back to you. Um, if there are no more questions, Lisa, from any of the panel here, any of the audience? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay. If there are no more questions from anyone, um, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Jack and Hannah again um, for taking the time to present the webinars. They will be up on the website as soon as possible. Um, apologies for the technical issues. Um, one more thing for those of you that are on the line from the 28 ESIP systems, a reminder that there are masterclasses on measurement that will be happening on the 26th and the 30th of November. Invites have been sent through to SRG chairs. Um, there are four places available for, per system. So please get in contact with your local system, your SRG, if those are something that you want to participate in. Um, those are only available to members of the 28 ESIP systems. Okay, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, goodbye from all of us here. <laughs>